let's do a very, very brief review about our indicators. This is a very straightforward chapter, and you have four indicators which you can apply if your leaders are global. What is the distinction between a global leader, somebody whose leadership is above the level of the nation state, and above global or international at least, international, and nation state or below? What is the big, big distinction? Well, that would be a distinction, yes, but that's not the important one. What is the important distinction? What do you have on the national and subnational level that you don't have on the international or global level? Norms. So, we don't have what? Norms, another word for norms are conventions. The important thing about conventions is not that they are, I mean, of course they're important in the fact that they exist, but the deciding factor is what with conventions? Whether or not they are enforced. There are conventions on the global level. They're not enforced. So, if there are, or rarely enforced, put it that way, and usually not enforced if you're powerful enough to avoid the sanctions, the punishments. So if you cannot be punished on the global level, what do we have on the global level? A culture of impunity. No punishment, impunity. So on the global and international levels, we have a culture of impunity by the very definition, which means people cannot acquire conventional ethical behavior or thinking on the international level. They have to get it on the national level or below and bring it with them like Dag Hammarskjöld did to the international or global level. Global would mean the entire world where international could also mean parts of the world. So, another point that this, the author, the distinction that the author makes is between morals and ethics. On the national level and the subnational level, we have conventional ethics. What do we have on the global level, according to the author? Does, Hammer, does Hansen use the term pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional? Is it in? No. He uses, a he uses a different set of terms, but he's referring to, to an extent, the same phenomenon, the same issues. He talks about morality. We could also apply Rest's and, uh, Hammers and, and uh, Kohlberg's concept of post-conventional. Now, what is the difference between morality, according to Hansen, and post-conventional on the global level, according to Rest and Kohlberg? What would be the big difference? What is post-conventional? according to Kohlberg. No, that's Hansen. What's the, what is the significance of a being on, or acting on the post-conventional level? You internalize, very good. You internalize conventions. So that's, it's slightly a different approach. What Kohlberg establishes is the idea that you are trained on the conventionals, on the, on the conventions, on the conventional level, and then you obey or you abide by these rules because you want to, not because you have to. That's slightly different than Hansen's set of terms. It's very important to make that distinction. He doesn't deal with the transition from the national to the global level the way, for example, Hammarskjöld does. Now we're pulling it all together. Now we have a variety of, of theories. We're done now with the reader. What does Hammarskjöld do when he talks about the transcending or the moving from the national to the international? Can someone close the door, please? 
What does he talk? What does he do? Hammerskjold is the other author in the reader who deals with the national versus international. How does he explain the way we would move from the one to the other? No. What are the points? What does he say? We had this on the first test. What does Hammerskjold tell us to do when we want to move from national ethics to international ethics? First of all, what do you have to do? You write them down. You write down the things that are essential for you from your national experience. And Hammerskjold gives, and also the author who's writing about Hammerskjold, what are the core sources of his moral and ethical behavior? Religion. Which are? Religion. His religious upbringing as a Protestant, a very devout Protestant, which means he has a Christian set of ethics. His culture, in which respect? In which respect? In which area? What was his day job? He was a government employee. He was a government official. So he grew up in civil service, in government service, being required to respect the laws. So, second one. Growing up in a system based on rule of law. So, Christianity, rule of law experience in Sweden, and the third one, He had a political. He had a political affiliation. He was a Marxist. He was a socialist. So we have socialism is important primarily with respect to the concept of justice. Everybody has to be treated fairly, even if they aren't from a wealthy family. So it's not only just merit, but it's also helping people who start out low on a low level in society. So, this is one way of transcending from the national to the international. Let's look at Hansen. What does Hansen say? What was, the, what, was the, what was the major thing that a global leader has to do? Transcend and... Transcend would be similar to Hammerskjold. You have to transcend. You have to go beyond your national ethical norms and establish, by, by the way, how does, how does uh, Hammerskjold transcend? How does he go beyond his national norms? What does he do? What does he, what does he recommend that we, before that? What does he recommend that you do? You, you make your list. What are your backgrounds? What are your red lines? I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to violate that rule because it's part of who I am as a Christian. I'm not going to violate that rule. That's part of what I learned as being a good bureaucrat and Swedish government service. I'm not going to violate that rule because as a socialist I wouldn't do that. But how does he go take that to the international level? No. No. That's the result. He takes his list and he compares it to other cultures and other ideologies and other religions. Not everybody's Protestant in Sweden. Not everybody's a socialist in Sweden. Not everybody's honest in Sweden. We'll leave that one out. Uh, but we take other ideologies and religions in Sweden and other ways of seeing things in China, in South America, in the Middle East. And what, what's, this, what's the process? We had this before, where it overlaps. What's that called? Triangulation. Triangulation. We find out where all of those inputs overlap, and this is what we can then use on the global level. This is how he transcends and goes beyond his Swedish Christian socialist background. But Hansen says you have to do more than that to be a global moral leader. We're going beyond conventions here. You don't, you don't, have, you don't have to only transcend, because when you transcend, you're basically dealing with what already exists. You know the concept in the box, right? No? To, be, to, go out, to go outside the box, to think outside the box? Your job as an undergraduate is to be completely capable of doing everything inside the box. You'll be tested. Do you know the entire amount of information and do you, have you mastered all the skills inside the box? Once you go into the master's program, 
you have to go outside the box. You have to think beyond the skills which you've required. You're required to know for your degree. By the way, if anybody's aspiring to become a doctor, to get a PhD, basically you could say, bachelor's degree, know the box perfectly. Master's degree, go beyond the box. PhD, create your own box. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, nice one. I, I just thought that up. Yeah, thank you. I'll use that from now on. Okay, see, so the, the goal would be that the teachers also learn something in class. Okay, so what does that mean when you go beyond the box? You change your environment. What's the word he uses? Transform. Transform, right. There's a big difference between transcend. Well, that's a good test question I haven't asked so far. What's the difference between transform and transcend, according to Hansen? Transcend is the easier one, is to take the box and go beyond it. Transform, create a new box. Create a new box. OK, is that clear? OK, now let's go quickly over the indicators that we dealt with uh, on Tuesday. And I, I really love the, I, don't, I mean, I don't love it, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, I find it very use, impressed by the situation in Syria, because every semester it offers us something new. Currently, the situation in Syria looks a lot different than it did six months ago. Six months ago, who was winning? The rebels were about to start losing. They were still on the march. Now, now they're on the defensive. Now we have the new Chinese-Russian oil deal. And it was yesterday, two days ago. What, what parentheses, question mark engineers, and anybody else who pays attention to the news. Is the oil deal a big engineering challenge for those two countries? Why? And the, it's actually a gas deal, long distance gas pipelines. But what's its political implication? What is the political significance of the Russian Chinese gas deal? Yes. Yeah, but more importantly, what is, are the US and the EU using gas to put pressure on Russia? Yes. How? They actually, the, uh, the EU is using Russian gas. Right. And, and uh, the whole thing is they want to get rid of the Russians. Yeah. That's why they need the Arab gas. Right. If the, if the European Union does not buy gas from Russia anymore, then Russia cannot put pressure on the European Union. If the European Union stops buying Russian gas and Russia does not find an alternative, they go, they go bankrupt and they could be forced to leave which part of Ukraine? Eastern. Crimea. That's the whole, that's the whole, whole, the whole thing that got started. Now obviously those pipelines have, are already being built. So this shift away from, Eastern, from, from Western Europe predates the crisis in, in Ukraine. But it, we see here that there are business issues, political issues, technical issues. What effect does this have on Syria? What, is it, what effect does the Russian-Chinese gas deal have on Syria? Yeah, OK. Or from Qatar. Qatar, so, so through Syria, for, but also the EU and the US lose their pressure on Russia, and Russia can still continue supporting the Syrian government. So there's a very complex set of calculations, but let's now look at whether the Syrian government is going to make any good use of this. Okay, what are the four indicators of a global, global moral leader according to Hansen? Now, you don't have to agree with Hansen, but you have to know what he said. So, what's the first one? A personal commitment. We, can, we said yes to that. Obviously, the Syrian government is committed to their, their agenda. The second one. Yeah. 
the, at least the Syrian government, along with the Iranian, Iraqi, partially Palestinian government and parts of the Lebanese government would agree we need a new moral agenda. What is that new moral agenda? According to the arc of resistance, what is the new moral agenda? A global system which is not under the control of the United States. Now that, that actually sounds pretty attractive to a lot of countries. So if countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela would agree that we don't need a single superpower telling everybody what to do, that would actually be a pretty attractive project. So, yes to number two. Number three. What's number three? The courage to stand up for your convictions. Obviously they have that as well. Picking a fight with the sole remaining superpower takes a lot of courage. Okay, the fourth point is the interesting one we talked about last time. What is the weakness? Promoting your agenda for which you're willing to sacrifice effectively. And here we see the weakness, if you will. Can we blame it exclusively on the, what's the H word? <laughs> Hegemony. Obviously, I'm going on Iraqi television today. If you can get Iraqi television, Al Atija. Anybody watch? Any, any Al Atija viewers in this class? Yeah? Atija. Iraqi 24 7 English language news. No, you don't watch? Yeah. Pro Iranian news. Uh, yeah. You're going to hear, you're gonna hear straight from the horse's mouth. I'm going to be live at 4.30, right, today. <laughs> so what you haven't heard in class, you can hear on Iraqi television. Anyway, the point is, hegemony is important. The reason Iraq has a 24-7 English language news station, the reason Iran has the same thing, especially the reason Russia, Russia Today, and by the way, Russia Today is actually worth, worth watching. It's very well done. Uh, the reason these countries have this is to break through U.S.-British hegemony. What's that called when you offer alternative voices? Counter. Counter hegemonic. But is that the only reason why Syria is not effectively getting its message out? The message is actually very attractive. Why are they failing? They don't have the soft skills. Why can WikiLeaks succeed where the Ba'ath Party fails? They have, they have scoff skills. They, 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 they know how to play the game on the global level. This is basically, if you want to help the Syrian government, for those of you who do, help them develop some soft skills assuming that their agenda is a good one. I don't know, maybe they, maybe they won't. I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, but they're obviously failing on this fourth point, which would mean, I'm, I'm waiting, if I keep on teaching this course long enough, will the Syrian government have developed soft skills or not? We'll see how many more semesters do you think that's going to take? Okay, let's have a look now at some of the global ethical leaders referred to in the reading. What we, we, we dealt with one yesterday. Who was it? Which pope? The first one. What, what, was, this, what was the encyclical? Leo the... Bravo. Leo the 13th in 1891, as opposed to the book, which is incorrect, issued the encyclical Rerum Novarum, basically stating that if you're unjust to workers or unjust to people who are weak in society, it's a sin. It's an interesting introduction of the concept of immorality to social issues. 
Normally when you think of immorality from a religious perspective, we think of sexuality, we think of drugs, abortion, whatever. And these are important topics. I'm not trying to say they're not important. But what Rerem Devarim does at this very early date is introduce the issue of social justice to the category of sin. And this is basically what Pope Francis has reintroduced very aggressively uh, recently. So we can talk about using the, four, the list of four. Now let's look at the list of four. Is Pope Francis or Pope Leo before him personally committed to these values? Obviously. Is there a need for this? What was the need back in 1891 for a Catholic justification for the threat of communism? Always sells good. Okay, factory owners, you have two choices. Either be nice to your workers or the communists are going to take over the country and take away your factory. It's up to you. Which one do you think most factory owners prefer? Be nice to the workers. It doesn't cost that much. Now, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union changed that uh, uh, agenda slightly, that equation, but we still have a lot of issues to deal with that are dealt with, that are, di that are direct results of poverty. Who's ever heard of Boko Haram? What is it? It's a Nigerian terrorist organization. There's no question about the fact that they're terrorists. Why do they have so much support in northern Nigeria? Because, yeah, that's, the, okay, because they're, they're, because they're Muslim and Muslims are fanatical, irrational people? Is that the, is that the explanation? What's, but what's, what's the, why, do, why is it such fertile soil? Why do so many people in northern Nigeria follow Boko Haram? It's the most underdeveloped region. It's a region that the government doesn't care about. Why do you think Good Luck Johnson is not doing anything about it? Who cares about them? They're up there in the north. They don't have anything to say anyway. So much of what we're referring to as global terrorism is actually a response to injustice, unfair treatment. So whether it's the communists or whether it's Muslim terrorists, they're both responding to a similar inequality. phenomenon, similar inequality. So there, is, there are still enough pressing reasons to have rerum novarum today. And the pope, of course, the current pope is very uh, aware of that. The third issue, courage. I mean, when the pope drives, ar drives around in a used Ford, he, there are two issues here. What are they? There were, remember the Pope Mobile, that gl bulletproof glass box that the other popes used to use? By the way, why was that introduced? He was shot, right. So, so, so out of experience. So what is the Pope doing when he's using a used Ford? He's making two points. First point is, I'm like everybody else. When he was, uh, when he was the, the Archbishop back in Buenos Aires, he took the metro to work. Yeah. That's the point. I mean, we could do that today. We could ask our church leaders to take the bus yeah. at least once. See how that works. It'd be a nice symbol, at least take the bus once, right? Uh, like, like the Pope. So one point is he's making a social point about or a social message about being like the people, but he's also doing something very, very courageous. What is it? He's not afraid. I mean, if you're in a Ford sedan, you're very open to assassination. He's, I'm sure he has his bodyguards, but this guy's actually putting his life on the line. And third, fourth point, is he getting his message out? Everybody's talking about him. I was teaching a course, and I'll be teaching it again this fall, advertisement. Uh, does anybody know George Shaheen from, uh, from civil engineering? He's now the head of Strumpf for, uh, he was here during the, you know him, right? Okay, George Shaheen was my big engineering fan club. He got like half the class was engineers. Uh, it's called the politics of Catholic social theory. It's a plug for my course next fall. Uh, I was teaching the course and the Pope was not Francis. It was Pope Benedict. Benedict. And Benedict had a lot to say about social injustice, but it was not his main message. And I was telling all my students about 
Rerum Navarum, and they were like looking at me, no, nah, I don't think so. They weren't really convinced. Then F Benedict resigns, Francis is appointed, and he was all over the internet. My students came to me right after the appointment of Francis and said, Doctor, uh, what you were saying in class, that's true. I said, what, you didn't believe me? He said, no, we didn't believe you. <laughs> Actually, what, what the Pope is now saying is even more radical than what, what you said in class. He got his message out. So he's obviously a very successful global moral leader. What are some of the other examples? It's that time again. That time again? Okay. What are some of the other examples in the book? Mother Teresa. Obviously very, very well known. What was her major message? Helping the poor, but not only that. Yeah, hopelessness. This is, there's, there's a difference between poverty and hopelessness. What is it? There, yeah, there's no way of getting out of it. She was dealing with the people who were not only poor, but also dying from diseases or from malnutrition, which they didn't need to die from. These are people who were victims of solvable problems. She was pointing this out. There's no reason why these people need to die except that we don't care. And she went and lived with them. And all that's very, very challenging, by the way. Anybody, any other thing? Some, something more related to your major? Anybody, anything more related to your major? What's that stand for? Three O's, yeah. International Standardization Organization. I think we had that on the first test, right? What, does anybody know what ISO 26000 is? No. OK, we've had it already. We've had it already. The six, the six examples of business being fair, business giving back to society. We go, let's go through them quickly again. Okay, the top one. Charity. Then. Paternalism. The famous example there would be Swarovski. Then. Philo. Philan. Philan. Can't spell philanthropy. Philanthropy. Sponsorship. Social partnership. CSR. And Social entrepreneurship. So, ISO 260 is CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. It's the ISO norm for corporate social responsibility. What is the difference between CSR and philanthropy? It's often confused. There's a professor in the business faculty who's really very, very, has a lot of expertise on this topic named Omar Sakar. Does anybody know him? No? Yeah? Go ask him. He'll tell you right off the bat. What's the big... It has something to do with Strumpf, yeah. That's, that's the link to George Shaheen, right? <laughs> okay. everything's, everything's sort of, you know... <laughs> I... I, uh, I I'll, I'll tell you... I'll tell you something off, off camera, okay. So, what's the difference? Core activity, the core area of activity. When a bank helps fund the marathon, it's not CSR. It's sponsorship or philanthropy. 
Sponsorship is more when you put your logo on a poster for an event. Like when you guys, your clubs do events, you go to whatever, Dunkin' Donuts, that's not philanthropy. But when an important event like a, like a marathon or a museum or uh, some important project gets real support from an institution or an individual rich person, we call this philanthropy, which basically means in Latin and Greek, phil means love, anthro, human beings, the love of mankind. Okay. The introduction of CSR, why is that an example of global moral leadership? What does CSR establish? What concept does it introduce? How does it transcend? It introduces on the global level the idea that corporations who make a lot of money from society have to give it back. Okay, but that could be philanthropy. What's the big difference? Why is it important? Yeah, why is that important? It links your business activity to the help you're giving society. So, for example, a computer company, when they do CSR, give me an example. That's the computer students, you're thinking about yourself, right? <laughs> Think about somebody who's really poor. What, what, what is one of the drawbacks and, and, and access to the internet? Very, very important. Large portions of the global population are illiterate from an ITC perspective. They are computer illiterates. They cannot acquire computer skills because they don't have access to the internet. Computers and the internet. And one of the requirements to have access to the internet is to have access to computers and electricity. Don't forget, a large part of the world does not have reliable, 24-7 reliable <laughs> access. I'm not mentioning any country. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we have generators, right? Uh, so, you have to supply electricity, you have to supply internet access, and you have to supply the hardware, and you have to teach the soft skills. If a computer company does that, or a software company does that, it's CSR. If a bank were to do CSR, give me an example. Micro, what's the, what's the technical term? Micro, micro credits or microfinance. Micro credit, micro finance, the same thing. It's giving very small, high risk loans to people who normally would have no access. By the way, there are parts of Lebanon where that is needed. We're talking here about a couple hundred dollars, often less than a thousand dollars. People who normally banks would look at and say, there's no way we're going to loan you that money. You, the interest is not low. It's usually 15 to 20 percent, and it's very short term. But the idea is to be with them. When a bank does this, they just don't give them the money and say, okay, year's over. Either give me the money back or I'll take your house. They, they send their employees. This is the point. Your staff is involved in this process. So bank employees get days off to go to the Baka or go to Akar and work with people setting up access to the internet and teaching computer skills. Or working with small businesses, for example, what is the typical scenario in Lebanon of small family farms? What happens? Small, small family farms. Are they viable? Can they survive economically? So what happens? Before they sell the, they sell the cow, okay. No, before they sell the cow, what usually happens on a small family farm if the family cannot live from farming? The father does what? He, come on, seriously. He goes and gets a job outside of the farm. He commutes, either on a daily basis, a weekly basis, 
or a yearly basis and he goes to the Gulf. Who stays at home? The wife, the grandmother, the women with the children. Now what would be better if those women were given a microloan to develop some niche product which they could sell to the global market? For example, handmade carpets or handicrafts or food for that matter. Okay, how are they going to sell it? Online. So now we can have an example of a bank and a computer company joining forces to help small farms where the father or the, hus the husband, the, the grandfather is not there, but the women are at home with the kids on the side, along with the farm, they produce products which they can sell online. You get the employees in the computer company, and you get the employees in the bank to work with these families. Why would that be good for the employees? Why would the bank or the computer company profit from this? Don't be so cynical. Don't be so cynical. Why, what, would, what would happen to the horizon of those employees? They could see the whole picture. You can, you can live in, in Beirut. I don't know why holistic doesn't have a W. <laughs> but I, as a child, I always wondered that, you know, because actually whole without a W means like a hole in the... But holistic is without a W. Someone has to explain. Holistic thinking is good for business. Why? Wait, wait, wait. Somebody in the back. Yes. It, okay. Holistic workers look at poverty, women's rights, disabilities, the environment, ethics. But they also look at productivity. And what are the two key variables, work organization, and technology. Open-minded people, open-minded is not just a word, it means your mind is accessible to thoughts, right? What does entropy mean? Does anyone know? Closed systems. Closed systems tend to decay. Entropy means that the system is closed, there's nothing going in or going out, it starts rotting in there. Open systems prosper. CSR creates open thinking amongst your employees. It's a very, very valuable asset. Okay, good. Related to that, let's have another example. From pa it's, um, we're, we're on page 85 here in the handwritten version and 299 on the actual page. What is another Example of global moral leadership. Right beside IS, ISO or ISO 26000. Another example. And you'll say, well, he did this. He laid a trap for us. He's always doing this. What are the co principles? Okay, we have ISO 26000. We have the UN Global Compact, those three. So what is the UN Global Compact? Does anyone know? The UN Global Compact is a set of 10 principles that organizations, not only corporations, not only for-profit institutions, also governments, cities for example. A city is an important administrative entity. What does a city do? A city government. By the way, why do city governments work well in Lebanon and the national government doesn't? Comparatively well. Because the mayor's children potentially will go to the same school with other people, right? You know him, right? He can't, he can't hide. A mayor, especially in a medium-sized town of, let's say, 40,000 people or smaller, there's no way for him to go and hide. If he does a lousy job, 
people were going to see him on the street. No matter how far, far, how luxurious his house is, small and medium-sized towns usually function better because there's a lot of contact between the population. So a city can also have CSR. Cities have taxes. They provide services. They have a lot of technical responsibilities. Engineers can work for cities, <laughs> for example, to get your attention. Uh, so the global compact is a set of 10 points about finance, about technical issues, about ecology, about treating your workers fairly. It's a UN document. It's a voluntary document that you can sign up to. Uh, and it's also, of course, good for your reputation. Isa, we talked about Co. Didn't we talk about Co before? Co is a conference center on Lake Geneva. On the one end of Lake Geneva, you have Geneva. And on the other, is anybody, are there any jazz fans here? Jazz? Some type of music? No jazz fans? OK, there's a, one of the world's best jazz festivals is in Montreux. Montreux is on the other end of Lake Geneva. And 600, 600 kilometers, 600 meters above Montreux, up in the mountain, is a small town called Co, with a conference center. What, every year, one or two students from NDU go there as interns. Um, and founded by initiatives of change. And what these principles did is establish, this, is, this was actually decades before CSR was introduced. There was, an, a, there was a discussion in the West, in countries like the US. Has anybody ever, ever heard of the company 3M? Yeah. Minnesota Mining and Minerals and Mining. It's a big mining and, and mineral processing company. In Minnesota. In Minnesota. Minnesota Mining and, because probably in Minnesota. OK. 3M and Philips. Has anybody heard of the Philips Corporation? Yes. Yes. Right, OK. They used to manufacture these <laughs> They used to. They still make stuff, OK. The, the owners of some of the big corporations in the West were concerned about the Japanese challenge. They used to call it the Japanese threat. They didn't call it the Japanese th challenge. Back in the 80s, we had companies like Sony starting to take over from the United States. And what they were concerned about is, do the Japanese have the same ethics in business that we do? So in Co, they set up this, this set of principles, very similar to CSR, but predating CSR by almost 20 years, to try to meet on a regular basis to talk about global issues related to business ethics. In 1989, what happened? The collapse of, well, the opening of the Berlin Wall, and in 91, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and now we have the reintroduction of the Soviet Union and later Russia and the other states to the global capitalist market. And so then there were three, if you will, regions. The United States and Europe, with a clear Western tradition as far as business and business ethics is concerned. Japan. And then later on, Taiwan, South Korea, ultimately China, and the former Soviet Union and the communist countries of Eastern Europe, East Germany, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, etc. So these three groups now meet on a regular basis. Every other year they meet in Co, and then they meet somewhere else. They just recently met in Thailand to talk about issues related to business ethics. So these are not only transcending, transcending is clear, I think, where you take the principles of the United States or of Holland or Canada and take them to the global level, those of Japan, those of Poland or whatever, but also transforming. Is it clear the difference between transcend and transform? Why does this actually not only raise things to a higher level but actually changes the very nature? It creates a global environment for <coughs> ethics, but it also does something. It brings in the various traditions. Last point in this respect, 
We've had this before. It brings in a whole variety of traditions. It's no longer the US and the UK who can put their stamp on global business and political dialogue, exchange. BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So importantly, the last point, the hegemony, did I write? No. The hegemony of the West is now being broken through by, by a lot of traditions. If we look at the West, what is the dominant ethical culture of the West? Where does it come from? Yes. Yeah. What, is the, what are the roots of Western? We're talking about Europe, Europe and North America. Where does, what, what do they all have in common? Okay, Judeo-Christian. Judeo-Christian, which means basically rooted in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This they have in common. What else do they have in common? Oh. Okay, why don't, why don't we do it? Include the Greeks, you're right, you have to include the Greeks. So there's another term that includes the Greeks. It's called Greco, has nothing to do with this class. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> Greco-Semitic. Greco-Semitic includes more. Greco-Semitic includes not only the Greeks, but also the Muslims, which, is, which are also Semitic. So Greco-Semitic is Hebrew, Christian, Muslim, and Hellenistic, which means ancient Greece and Rome. So this, this regional culture of right and wrong, this is the dominant Western way of seeing things. What, does, what, do, what do these initiatives expand? And what, what, what else do they have in common? They have modernization. When did this, when did this region as a whole become industrial? In the 19th century. The 19th century is the 1800s. So the, the, the modernization is in the 1800s. When did the rest of the world become industrialized? In the 20th century. Big difference. So the West shares two things. This Greco-Semitic tradition of right and wrong, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is also mentioned in the book, is a product of Greco-Semitic thinking. By the way, there was a very important Christian from this region who played a role in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Shal Malik, which doesn't, which doesn't mean that it's necessarily American or British, but it does mean it's Semitic. So be, be aware of that. Our roots, Hebrew, Christian, Muslim, are this region here plus Europe. So who would be unhappy about that? The Chinese, for example. What does this have to do with us? I mean, this is not our tradition. Why do we, the Indians, why do we have to agree? This is not, yeah. This has been, this, is, this has been literally forced upon the rest of the world through what mechanism? Why was the West able to dominate the rest of the world? Because of technology and capitalist market economies in the, in the 19th century. That's what allowed them to force, and ultimately we have to say our way, because it's also Semitic, our way of seeing things was forced on the Chinese, was forced on the Indians because of the success of the Industrial Revolution. So what this does is it opens up the dialogue between our region, and ultimately, this is, I like this thought because it means that Lebanon and Palestine and Egypt are part of the same mindset as France and England. Anyway, so to finish that up. Okay, good. So what are we going to do now? We're going to do a review of the various topics. Now where did I put my mobile phone? Good. You, this is what you want, right? Okay, we have 20 minutes. That's what we said, right? 20 minutes to go over Zimbardo, Hill, and Hansen. 
Remember, the final is cumulative. Yes, I'm sure. You're asking me if I'm sure? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> what, let's look at it now. What have we learned which enables us to link everything together? What are some of the core thoughts that we've now established that tie in all of the readings? For example, deontology versus you. I'm a utilitarianism, somehow linked to universalism versus relative. Ism. I hear somebody talking. Please raise your hand if you have a question. These two, this dichotomy, dichotomy, two, two aspects which are somehow in conflict with each other. Either you believe that what is right is right no matter what, no matter whether the consequences are good, neutral, or bad. I do the right thing. Or I look at the results based on the concept of the greatest good for the greatest number of people. That's utilitarianism, right. If I am basing my ethics on the deontology, if they're deontological, then I'm most likely a universalist. The three Abrahamic religions are all universalist. What does Abrahamic religions mean? <laughs> Jews, Christians, Muslims. All three, of, all three of our religions believe it's my way or the highway. <laughs> you can't, which makes us mutually exclusive. Christians cannot live in peace with Jews because Jews don't accept Christ as as the Messiah. We not only say that Christ is our Messiah, we say that Christ is their Messiah. They go, what? <laughs> Do you know that? This is the whole reason for Christian anti-Semitism. The reason that historically Christians didn't like Jews was not because, why don't, why don't Christians like Jews? Because they killed Christ. I love that answer. Imagine they didn't. Where would you be now? No crucifixion, no resurrection. resurrection. Aren't you grateful that the Jews killed Christ? <laughs> In a way, because no crucifixion, no resurrection. That means we'd all be slaughtering sheep and putting the blood on our doors and stuff like they did in the Old Testament. <laughs> Why don't we do that anymore? Because of the crucifixion, okay. This is not the reason. The, the, con the historical conflict between Jews and Christians was because Jews did not recognize Christ as being their Messiah. Not ours, theirs. Okay, so Christianity and Judaism are mutually exclusive. What is the major conflict between Christians and Muslims? That Christ is the Son of God. So, ultimate, well that's the whole point. It's part of the Trinity. The Trin Trinitarian thinking is that Christ is the, yeah. Okay, so universalism is not the same thing as deontology, but they're linked. If you believe that what's right is right no matter what the consequences are, you're ultimately a universalist. Relativism, relativism and utilitarianism are also not quite the same thing, but the best way for utilitarians to apply their ethics is through relativism. Because, let's take Greco. Let's pick on Greco. Greco walks into the hospital. Perfectly healthy guy, right? There's one person who's dying of liver disease. One person's dying of heart disease. One person's dying of lung disease. One person's dying of kidney disease. And one person's dying, what else is there? Brain disease, whatever, okay. So what do we do? We cut up Greco into five parts. 
we, give, we tr- divide them up, and, and five people live, and Greco dies. From a utilitarian perspective, it's good. Sorry, Greco. Don't ever go into a utilitarian hospital, okay? <laughs> if I were you, I would go into a deontological hospital, which assumes that the human life is not negotiable. You don't kill one person to save a million, like they do in 24 with uh, Jack Bauer. Okay, so relativism is a little bit different. Relativism assumes that the ethics applies differently in different regions. The whole purpose of the co-principles was to overcome relativism. We have three traditions. What's the big difference between Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Central, excuse me, Central and Western Europe and Eastern Europe? They're both Christian, right? What's the predominant religious tradition in Western Europe and North America? Protestantism. There's only one country in Western Europe that is Catholic and they're not Christian. France. It's not that important. Spain, Italy, and Poland more recently are Catholic countries but they're not dominant economic and global players. France is, but France has been officially secular for 100 years. So that Catholicism does not play much of a role in Western Europe. Protestantism does, as does Protestantism in North America. In Eastern Europe, Orthodox. So there's a slight difference between the two. Protestantism, oh, I'm not going to go into that, it's, it'll take us too far. So, but the big difference is with China and India. China and India are not monotheist there. No one took a religion course. They're not polytheists, no. <laughs> Buddhism and Hinduism are not polytheists. They are... Pantheists. The pantheist traditions are much different than the monotheist traditions. What the co-roundtable does, it attempts to find common ethical ground to transcend the, different, the stark, the extreme differences in culture. Eastern Europe is slightly different than Western Europe, but Asia is very much different. So, find it, find, to find a universal approach to business ethics transcending the various cultures. Okay, second thing that we need to keep in mind is where does your ethics come from? What is the difference between what is the difference between morals or morality and ethics? The codification. Codes is another word for norms, which is another word for conventions. So a convention is a codified set of morals. So let's have a look now at the conventions. Let's, let's, let's look at conventional ethics. Kohlberg, where does the conventional ethics come from? How do you arrive at conventional ethics? By starting out at pre-conventional, and you work your way up. According to Rest, that, that's Kohlberg's staircase. Rest, yeah, but where do you, where do you get your conventional ethics from? From your, from your socialization. You don't have to go through the staircase. Okay, Hammerschild, of course, we just discussed that. Okay, now let's look at, look at, let's look at Zimbardo using this background. Zimbardo divides ethics into three, or ethical, he's of course fo- focusing on unethical behavior. Why do people act ethically or unethically according to Zimbardo. He lists three traditional ways of seeing this. Bravo, louder. Dispositional. We 
which of, the, which of our thinkers would put a, an amazing amount of emphasis on dispositional ethics? More important. In between, in between. Hammerskjold. Hammerskjold. Basically, Hammerskjold emphasizes the individual need to work on this all your life. By the way, I, the reading that you have from Zimbardo, I gave to, I mentioned this before, I gave this reading to uh, Asad Shaftari, who you've all heard of now because of the movie Sleepless Nights, right? After that movie came out, everybody saw the movie. And so, anyway, why, why, I told you this before, I think, but why did Asad Shaftari hate Zimbardo? What, what did Assad Shaftari do that no other leading civil war leader do? Leading. He confessed what he did as an individual, and after he confessed, he, he asked for forgiveness. This is based on which model? He didn't do it because of this, but there's a model. Which country did this in an institutional way? Everybody had to do it or go to jail or face jail. The, remember the truth and reconciliation commission in South Africa. In South Africa, Everybody who had committed a war crime or a crime against humanity, and remember there's no statute of limitations on these two crimes. What does that mean? Statute of limitations? No. No, statute of limitations is about time. You're confusing two things. There are two human rights which are non-negotiable. Slavery and torture. It's a different issue. Statute of limitations means if I, when you were 13 years old, you stole a tennis racket from the sports store, and when you're 75, they found out it was you, they can't do anything about it, right? It's too late. There's a time limit on every single crime, except two, war crimes and crimes against humanity. So basically, the amnesty that the Lebanese leaders gave themselves is only valid in Lebanon. If people were actually to go to court outside of Lebanon, they could get them. Because that, that, there's, those were crimes against humanity. Those were war crimes. There's no statute of limitations. As long as you're alive, they can get you. But what he did was, is he admitted what he had done, confessed, and asked for forgiveness. The same way they did it in South Africa. When he read the article, he said, I don't like this article because I see the whole focus, as far as I'm concerned, on personal responsibility. And what's Zimbardo doing? He's adding situational and ultimately systemic. OK, guys, this is a little bit tricky to understand, but why do a lot of people, I mean, children, children tend to do this. I did this. My sister was a year younger than me. But there's a period in the life of girls where they grow faster than boys. It only lasted about a year, and then <laughs> stopped, and then it was payback time, right? Anyway, so uh, when you do something wrong and you get caught, you say, why are you looking at me? My sister did it first. Or why are you looking at me? My brother did it first. And what does your mother say? I don't care what your brother did. I caught you. <laughs> we all know the scenario, right? What kind of logic are you using? <laughs> You're saying, well, other people did it. Why should I be punished? You're using situational thinking. If people are getting away with this all the time, if you get caught cheating on the final, what's usually your first argument. Everyone else is cheating. Everyone else is cheating. Why should I get punished, right? So what, what Shaftari was saying is what Zimbardo is, is basically doing is letting everybody off the hook. If everybody's killing, wh why should I be punished? Why should I admit? Okay, just keep that thought. Systemic goes further. 
it says not only are there a bunch of people getting away with some, doing something wrong, but the barrel maker, the person who sets up the system, is setting up a system where people who are do, doing good are punished and people who are doing bad are rewarded. The best example of that would be, of course, Nazi Germany, but also Stalinist Russia. So, do you want to raise your hand if you have a question back there? Okay, good. Why is this not true? What is, what is Zimbardo trying, what's the point Zimbardo is making? In a situational s setting where everybody's getting away with it, who's ultimately responsible for the unethical acts of each individual? Each individual. We know, you know this from the Bible and the Quran. When you die on the judgment day, when you go to the to St. Peter, if you're Christian, whoever's going to judge you, you can say, well, it was my mother, my priest, my sheikh, my boss, the mayor made me do it. Is that how it works, according to the Bible and the Quran? No. Ultimately, every, what he's trying to point out is that even in a situational setting, there are people behind this. That when you, for example, he, he, he uses the example of Abu Ghraib. Does everybody remember that? The, the, the prison in Iraq, where there were a lot of horrible things going on and the people who were ultimately arrested were very low-level non-officers. They were privates, the lowest level, and they, the, they were the ones who got punished and everybody above them didn't. And he was arguing, poor guys. I mean, they were like 19, 22-year-old guys. They were fresh from the United States, from some mountainous village. They didn't know what was going on. People above them were doing it too. They were, they were a good apple put in a bad barrel. So he's saying point one, don't just take that one private, that one person on the lowest level who got caught. Look at, all, look at the environment. But then he's ultimately saying, who set up that prison? Who created, who runs the army? The, the, the commanders, the, the heads of the different army, navies, air force. And who runs them? the President of the United States, George W. Bush. So ultimately, Zimbardo argued that private should be here and he should pay the price. But his officers should too. And the last person, or the first person I want to see actually, in this courtroom being charged with this crime is the President of the United States, who's ultimately responsible. So I would argue, and I, this is how I argued with, with, with Assad Shaftari, who I know personally, uh, Look, he's not taking the blame away from the individual. He's just pointing out that the individual's not the only person responsible. There's a lot of other people who should also be held accountable. OK. What did Zimbardo notice in his experiments? By the way, Zimbardo did something very similar to what Kohlberg did. He used an empirical approach. He's not talking about what's right and what's wrong but how people act and how they have, we have two more minutes, bear with me. Uh, last point, what does Zimbardo notice in all of his experiments? That most people cave in to systemic and situational pressures. Most people, most good people become bad people in a bad setting. But what else does he notice? no matter how harsh the pressures are, there's always around 10% who don't. He calls this heroic behavior. Why is it that in any given setting, no matter how much pressure you apply on people to be bad, some people just refuse. They, they remain deontological if need be, to their death. What, is, what causes that? He's an atheist. Zimbardo is an atheist, so he can't use God, right? What, he wants to figure out why people who don't, because he can't use the religious argument, that would be easy, oh, it's the Holy Spirit, you know. What I, okay, if you don't believe in God, what is it that causes 10% to remain steadfast no matter what? And so that's the emphasis he's actually placing in his current research.